Now we're going to look at the number one cult of Christianity with respect to numbers in the world. That is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a.k.a. Mormonism. Now here, it's just flat out, Mormonism is a theological cult of Christianity. It satisfies every element of the definition that I gave for a cult of Christianity. And, for example, rejecting the authority of Scripture as a whole. See, the Mormons believe in the Bible insofar as it's correctly translated, meaning what they really believe and teach is that the Bible was so corrupt that we can't rely on it anymore, so we needed new revelation from God, and that this was supposedly given through the words of the living prophet, from uh, Joseph Smith, all through the living prophets on down since him. And, of course, Joseph Smith claimed to discover um, the Book of Mormon, which was supposedly a record of a group of ancient Jews that came to America in 600 B.C. and set up a Jewish civilization there. Uh, but somehow they wrote and reformed Egyptian hieroglyphs uh, and wrote on golden plates and left a record of their, uh, their trip to America and their time in America there. And then Joseph Smith, what did he do? He, uh, Joseph Smith uh, claimed that the angel Moroni came to him and gave and told him in the end, of course, uh, I'm going to show you where these plates are buried, I'm going to give you the urine and the thumbing, and this is how you're going to translate it and make known this new this, this record of people uh, of ancient Israel. So, so again, they reject the scripture and replace it with the words of their living prophet. They reject the scripture and replace it with the, uh, uh, the Book of Mormon and other sources. So remember, that's the first step. If you're going to have something other than biblical Christianity, you have to have something else in authority other than the Bible. And so in the end, the Bible is weighed down here, and it's corrected and judged by what the living prophet and what their other sources say. So this is why when you get to Mormon doctrine, and now when I say Mormonism, here's an important point, is that in America, at least, there are over 125 Mormon denominations, and they don't all believe the same thing. The big, the big one, the one headquartered in Salt Lake City, is the one that has claims 13 million members, that they have, uh, you know, and teach these doctrines that I'm saying. But there are other, for example, the Salt Lake City Mormon Church is polytheistic. They believe that there are literally billions and billions and billions of gods, and every Mormon male with the priesthood has the opportunity to work hard and to try and become a god. So, so in this sense, it is unique among cults of Christianity, because most of the cults of Christianity don't like the doctrine of the Trinity, so like the Jehovah's Witnesses become Unitarians and Arians. They believe Jehovah is only one person, and that Christ was a created being, such as Michael the Archangel. But Mormons are unique because there, there really haven't been, in the history of the church, groups that have been explicitly polytheistic, that say there are millions of gods that exist, that they can uh, become a god someday. In fact, you know, every Mormon male thinks that God is an exalted man. He lives on his own planet. He has, he, he's a man who was exalted, has a body of flesh and bones. And as uh, one of the Mormon prophets has said in times past, he says, you know, as, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. That was Lorenzo Snow. I think he was a fourth or fifth prophet of the Mormon church. He just summed it up nicely for us. So, so that's why when we look at this, it, it's amazing to me that something that is the most antithetical to Christianity could become the largest of the cults of Christianity uh, with this. Because, I mean, because usually... What you get in church history are people who put their own sense of reason before trusting the scripture. And they say, I can't understand the Trinity, so I'm going to reject it and reduce God to being one person. Okay? And that's what usually happens amongst the groups. But here, you've got an explicit polytheism, so it's, it's a bit different. And then, while a lot of the cults of Christianity teach salvation by some combination of faith and works, Mormons are explicit that your salvation, and they have two kinds of salvation, individual salvation and general salvation. General salvation just means Jesus died, uh, actually bled in the Garden of Gethsemane to reduce Adam's transgression, to guarantee bodily resurrection for everyone. Uh, but 
individual salvation, according to the Mormon, is 100% by your works. There's no grace involved. And that means, uh, even though everyone's guaranteed resurrection now because of Christ's work, you have to work hard and basically perfect yourself so you can get to one of the levels of heaven, where the ultimate level, uh, level of heaven, the celestial kingdom, is where you can become a god. So, so it's complete rejection of salvation by grace. Now, finally, when you think about uh, its view of deification and what ultimate salvation is, if you had to know anything about Mormonism, Mormonism is paganism that is basically disguised as Christianity. And if you look at it closely, and, and I know those are strong sounding words, but how many, what is, a, what is a pagan? These are primarily the old polytheistic religions that have come back, those that believed in many gods, those that worshiped many gods, and that they hope to, through their own work, grow to the point where they can have the powers of those, uh, uh, of those gods. This is very akin to, and there is a lot of occultism that goes on in Mormonism. Uh, for example, I say this because there's a thin veil between the physical and the spiritual world in Mormonism. I can tell you after speaking with a number of Mormons, uh, while you're not going to find a church booklet on this, what you will find are that a number of Mormons believe that, you know, as they're doing their genealogical research, and people ask, if some of you know about Mormonism and genealogies, uh, Mormons have some of the best genealogical libraries in the world. And in uh, thinking about that background, why? Because according to the Mormons, someone can accept Christ in the afterlife, but they're not saved till they're water baptized. So this is why in the Mormon temples, they have a ceremony called baptism for the dead, where an individual Mormon is uh, a live Mormon, is baptized in the place of a dead person so that they can be saved in the afterlife. So this is why Mormons do their genealogies, because they're supposed to do their genealogy and submit their names to the temples so that the temples can do these baptisms for the dead, for their relatives. But sometimes people get stuck in their genealogies, there's records missing. And again, I've had discussions with a dozen Mormons or so that say what they do is they just ask their dead relatives to come talk to them and give them the missing information. They practice spiritism. And so, again, and more, I could tell you more on that, but, but yes, yeah, so there is occultism that goes on in Mormonism at a number of levels. So, but it's a polytheistic worldview that is disguised as Christianity, if you had to have a takeaway for this. So now, for any of these groups, we want to be efficient in the way we talk to people, so we move to the next phase. What, what are the two pillars or foundations of Mormonism? And that's really the key, because you don't want to talk about the, the irrelevant things or the secondary things. If you can refute and deal with the two main issues or the couple of main foundations for any group, then you, you can have a much more efficient time dealing with them. So the, the two pillars of Mormonism are, first, whether or not there really was a prophet Lehi. Okay? And Lehi is the character in the Book of Mormon that allegedly is in Jerusalem in 600 BC, and he gets supposedly a call from God to come to America to leave Jerusalem and set up a new Zion here in America. And so that's the story. And then the second pillar is the claim of the total apostasy of the church and Joseph Smith's first vision that he received, allegedly received in 1820, claiming that he was gonna restore the true church to the earth. Okay, So if you can take out both of those, then you've taken out what the, the defining characteristics of Mormonism. Because Mormonism is built on the authority of Joseph Smith the prophet and the authority of the Book of Mormon. So, so let's take a quick look at, and again, very quick look. I've got these handouts up on my website. If you look at theolaw.org, T-H-E-O-L-A-W.org, www.theolaw.org. That's my Biola faculty website. I have these, all of these up there for free. You can download and use. And uh, again, they're more expanded versions of this talk. But, all right, legitimacy of the prophet Lehi. Um, first, I'll just say this. Uh, 
Jeremiah 27, and you want, might want to note this, completely refutes the claim of the calling of Lehi. Because according to Jeremiah 27, and I'll just summarize it for you for the sake of time, is that at the same time and in the same place, as supposedly the prophet Lehi is called in the Book of Mormon. In 1 Nephi chapter 1, it says, in the beginning of the reign of you know, Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, you know, bam, that sets the context. 600 B.C. in Jerusalem. And then what the Book of Mormon says in chapters 1 and 2 in the book of 1 Nephi, which is the first book in the Book of Mormon, is the bottom line, that God told Lehi to leave Jerusalem not to submit to the king of Babylon, because remember Babylon was sieging Jerusalem, and to go to this land far, far away. But Jeremiah 27 had a different view. See, Jeremiah 27, and uh, this is great, and that's, I think it's just more proof of the inspiration of Scripture, because God knew Mormonism would be around and make this claim. So it makes an explicit claim in the book of Jeremiah that uh, in Jeremiah 27, Here's what God says. In the end, in verses 6 through 8, he says, all the nations will submit to the king of Babylon. Period. And all the nations that don't submit to the king of Babylon, uh, I will punish that nation with the sword, with famine and pestilence, until I have destroyed him by its hand. So, remember, this was a punishment that the people of God were undergoing, a disciplinary action by God, because they weren't faithful. So God says, yes, you're going to submit to the king of Babylon. What did Lehi say? No, God, the false god supposedly told Lehi not to submit to the king of Babylon. But more relevant is verse 9. According to the Book of Mormon, how did Lehi get this revelation? By a dream from the Lord. Now what does Jeremiah say in Jeremiah 27, verse 9? But as for you, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers who speak to you, saying you shall not serve the king of Babylon. For they prophesy a lie to you in order to remove you far from the land. And I will drive you out, you will perish. Well, there it is. Lehi got a dream. He left the land. And what happened to his followers that went to America? Well, according to the, uh, uh, the Book of Mormon and the Mormon Church, they perished. So if, now there's no evidence that there really was a Lehi whoever existed. So for the sake of argument, you tell the Mormon, if he existed at all, who was he? He was one of the false prophets mentioned by Jeremiah, who got a dream not to submit to the king of Babylon to re be removed far from the land. Now, if you look at where Jerusalem is and where America is, it's almost literally halfway around the world. You can't be removed further from the land uh, than where he went. And there are many other reasons biblically, if you look at your Old Testament theology, that land is the land God gave the Jews. That was, their, that was their promised land. That was their land of inheritance. This is why uh, the very notion, if we get to the, you know, the book of Ezekiel, the whole promise was that God would take them out of captivity and bring them back to the land you know, to fulfill the, you know, the Abrahamic covenant, these promises that God made to them, that God is faithful, but they weren't faithful. So there's pillar number one. There's many more arguments, but that's, that's one. So... If Lehi existed at all, he was a false prophet. Okay. Pillar two is the total apostasy. Number one, they just claim there's no true churches, no true believers. But here's the problem, uh, is that, one, it doesn't fit church history. You ask the Mormon to give you some evidence. Uh, when in church history did the fall happen? They can't pinpoint it for you. Uh, or, more importantly for them, is that when you look at the evidence uh, against it, there's an argument from the Book of Mormon itself and from the Doctrine and Covenants, which is essentially this. According to the Book of Mormon, when Jesus Christ allegedly came to America right after he left Jerusalem to talk to these Nephites, he set up a church here with their own 12 apostles. And according to the Book of Mormon, in 3 Nephi chapter 28, Christ chose three of these apostles to remain alive on earth until the second coming. And the Doctrine and Covenants teaches that the Apostle John never died, and that he's on earth alive until the second coming. So these are parts of Mormon doctrine. So forget everyone else, but according to the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, part of the other Mormon standard work, you can't have a total apostasy because you at least have four live apostles directly trained by Jesus Christ 
that are immortal and walking the earth till the second coming. And the Mormons don't believe the second coming has happened yet. So they don't put two and two together and get 22. Of course, don't follow my math here, okay? So, yeah, they, they never put those things together, but that's why you need to put it together. Point is, you can argue from church history, you can argue from doctrine, you can argue all those things. But in the end, what you've got is say, uh, uh, an issue where uh, uh, you can take out the two pillars of Mormonism pretty quickly for someone who's interested. Now, quick overview, current trends in Mormonism. Where prior to about 25, 30 years ago, Mormons would say, you're in a false church. Now they say, we're just like you. So part of the problem is when you're talking to the Mormons is that what you have to do is get them to admit what they really believe. Uh, so, that, so again, there are a number of ways to do that, but uh, we can't cover them here. There's also groups in Mormonism, uh, the Farms, the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, uh, the Maxwell Institute on the Brigham Young University campus, who are trying to prove the historicity of the Book of Mormon. And again, there are a number of scholarly articles out there. It's, it's flawed scholarship, but just note that they're out there using this and that they're good uh, organizations that have written reputations for this. Now, a couple of key issues in Mormonism is, um, again, overview. Mormon epistemology, I, I talked about experience over doctrine in Mormonism. And the whole point is, is ultimately for the Mormon and for any religion where their affirmations don't correspond to reality, to a mind-independent external world, you can't have the normal means of epistemology in proving things. Why? Because if you did, you'd find out that it doesn't, it doesn't fit. You can't verify the information in your book. You can't verify you know, the claims that God gave you. For example, when, when, the book of, when the Bible says there's a place called Jerusalem, we can, we can actually go look for a place called Jerusalem, okay, because it's there, external evidence. When the Mormons talk about, you know, the places in the Book of Mormon or the people in the Book of Mormon, there's just no external evidence they ever existed. So how do you have to know it? It can't be based on reason. It can't be based by argument. It can't be based on verification in the external world. It's got to be based on internal. Pray about it and see whether it's true. That's why they have to have some sense of, mysticism uh, apart from anything else. I prayed about it and I know it's true. So, and that, that presents all sorts of uh, issues. But finally, uh, and for the couple of minutes we have left, then we'll take some questions. Ultimately, what the Mormons want to get you to do is pray about the Book of Mormon. Any, any of you have had the Mormons ask you to pray about the Book of Mormon before? Because in the end they're going to say, well, let's not argue about this. Why don't you pray about the Book of Mormon? Because there's a, you know, bring in a Moroni 10-4, which uh, Moroni 10.4 in the Book of Mormon says, if you ask with a sincere heart and real intent, God will manifest the truth of these things unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, that said, there are four, you don't want to pray about the Book of Mormon because that's not the test. The test is, if God has already revealed something, we stand by Scripture. So you remember Paul said, be a Berean, right? The Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica because when he came and spoke to them, he said they searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things were so. So the test is, is that you test what anybody says by what the scripture says. But what do the Mormons want you to do? Avoid that test and do what? Go to uh, some subjective test, pray about the Book of Mormon. Uh, four quick things here. Um, the rhetorical response, you want to get their attention. Um, just ask them whether or not you should have to pray about committing murder or adultery. Do you have to pray about that? No. Why? Because God has already revealed that it's wrong. So if God's already revealed it, then you don't have to pray about it, do you? And that's why you want to get them to own the principle that, you know, if God's already revealed it, then we don't have to pray about it. God's given us the scripture. Biblical response, like I said, Acts 17, 11, Isaiah 8, 19, and 20, teach that principle that we test all things by Scripture itself first. And if it doesn't measure up, we reject it. It's not from God. The logical problem, it's circular reasoning. Circular reasoning means that your conclusion is contained in your premise. Okay, So we want you to pray about the Book of Mormon to see whether it's true. Yeah, but I have to follow the instructions in the Book of Mormon as true to pray about it to see whether it's true. So you see, so there's a logic error to it. I'm not going to accept that. And then finally, 
the LDS doctrine related response to pray about the Book of Mormon uh, is that, again, what, what's important here is that you bring them to the first vision, okay? Joseph Smith prayed, and we think about this, you know, the, the LDS response to it uh, is that we need to search the scriptures and that we need to go to their first vision and bring them right back to the pillars uh, to see what it 